Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta and in Butte, Montana or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us. You know, each week we get to talk to about how much we appreciate our sponsor support. They help make all of this happen and provide us the ability to bring you each episode. With that, thanks to Bee Culture Magazine for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. Subscribe to Bee Culture today. We also want to thank Two Million Blossoms as sponsor of this episode. Two Million Blossoms is a quarterly magazine dedicated to protecting all pollinators. Learn more in our Season 2, Episode 9 podcast with editor and our guest co-host, Kirsten Trainer from visiting www.2millionblossoms.com, and that is with the number two. Hey, everybody. Thanks again for joining us. We have a great episode all set for you in today's return of friend of the podcast, Dr. Samuel Ramsey who's here to give us a quick update on the current research on Varroa and the Tropolae laps and a few other things, but more on that in a few minutes. Hey, Kim, how's spring there in Ohio? Has it sprung yet? Well, yesterday it did, and today it sprung back. Um, <laughs> it was, you know, 65 degrees, 70 last weekend. Today it's barely 50, and it's trying to rain, and the wind's blowing, so... Um, uh, it's a, t- it's, it's a typical April in Ohio, which is ugly yeah. most of the time. We're supposed to get up to 80 this weekend and, and it's it, end of or middle of April and everyone's going to be complaining about the heat in Washington state at 80, but then June will come and they call June around here, June timber, because it gets cold and drizzly and gray again. So after this nice weather, then it gets cold and drizzly again until about the 4th of July, and then summer returns. It's, so there's it's some justice after all for all your beautiful April weather, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather move it and swap it around, but it's, it'll be good. I'm looking forward to getting into bees yeah. this weekend. Everything here is early. Um, everything is early. All the plants are early. Uh, we've got things blooming. I'm about two weeks early on a lot of the bulbs and, and uh, some of the trees. Uh, mm-hmm. So so it, they'll be ready, and hopefully they won't be gone by the time the bees get enough bees to do some foraging. Yeah, I keep watching the flowers and the fruit trees and everything, and there's not a whole lot of bees out there, so they're right. mostly back tending the brood. Today they're staying home keeping warm. <laughs> Dry there in Ohio. So coming up, we have, um, I just was going through the Mia email, and uh, WAS has their April mini conference on e- April 28th, and that'll be coming up. And the program is uh, is focused on soldiers, veterans, and honeybees. And they have a couple speakers on, uh, like the Heroes to Hives, like we had with Adam uh, a couple uh, episodes ago, and a, a psychologist talking about bees and, and agriculture and, and um in therapy, uh, therapeutic settings. So that, that'll that be a good session for anybody for WAS. Uh, Honey Bee Obscure is really picking up. You guys are doing a great job there. Yeah, we're, like I said last time, we found we found uh, this old book that's uh, 150 answers for questions. And um, we're going over those. And we're also looking at, you know, we're going to look at pollen traps. And mm-hmm. then we'll go back to the old one. And we're going to talk about tanging and, and, and drumming. So the pollen trap thing was fun, and and uh, I've been an advocate of pollen traps forever. It's free food, and it's the best yeah. food you can give to bees. So why don't why more people don't trap pollen has always kind of amazed me. And you know, I'll tell you a quick story, Jeff. I talk about this a lot when I'm out, you know, giving talks, and 
I, I, I'm, I'm pretty good at convincing people that they should be trapping pollen. So when I'm done, everybody makes a bolt for the door. They go to the nearest vendor. They buy all the pollen traps in the place in, in 10 minutes. And then all the vendors come and beat <laughs> me up because why didn't you tell me I would have brought more? So <laughs> there's something to this. And, and, and I've had a, a good number of people contact me after that and say, you know, why didn't you talk to me 20 years ago? So Jim and I are going to talk about pollen traps and pollen and, and all those good things. So it's, uh, yeah, Obscure is doing well. We're having fun. Very good. Yeah, it sounds really, really good. You know, one of the things about pollen traps that I think often gets missed or not communicated well is that the traps don't stay on the hives 24 hours a day. They're, you turn them on and off. Uh, isn't that correct? Isn't that the best way? That's correct, and you know what you can do. You can get really, you can get clever with these things if you're, if you're hanging around. Some things bloom in the morning and are done by afternoon. Some things bloom mm -hmm. in the afternoon. You know, don't start until the afternoon. So you can you can flip that switch and catch all the morning pollen and turn it off because you don't want the corn pollen that's coming in. You know, later on or whatever. Um, and yes, you can, you know, basically what I do is I have it on for two days and then I have it off for a week and then on for mm. two days and off for a week. And that gives me more than I need for that colony for, you know, next, uh, next spring. Oh, fantastic. Well, good. That's, a, that's an episode that's out there now and available in honeybeeobscura.com. And I encourage uh, our listeners to go out there and listen to it if you haven't already and encourage your friends, the more the merrier. Hey, Kim, each week we ask our listeners to send us questions and, and, and emails. And this week we received one from Joel Dawson, and he was talking about his splits he made. And he was finding drones, and he was excited because he had drones in with the, all the, the queen cells. And he was excited thinking that the, the drones, and the, because the drones were there with the queens, and he thought that that was going to be a great thing for his splits. And he said he talked to his uh, beekeeper, master beekeeper friend, and uh, she told him that the drones in the hive do not inseminate the new virgin queens. And he hadn't heard that, and he was just questioning us on that logic. Well, his friend had it exactly right. The, yep. uh, the drones from the hive don't mate with the queens from the same hive, uh, generally. And um, I, I think she spelled it out, and you also had something in the answer that you sent. Um, mm -hmm spilled it out that drones uh, are going to fly a lot farther uh, than the queens from the same hive, and they're going to head out for different drone congregation areas. Queens going to one and the drones from that hive is going to the other. And, of course, what that does is uh, stop drones from the same mother, drones and queens from the same mother's uh, breeding. It gets rid of that opportunity, and it increases the uh, variability and, and the diversity of the queens that do get mated. They're going to have drones from several many, maybe many colonies, and they're going to mate with more than one drone, of course, uh, you know, up to, up to 20, um, mm -hmm. sometimes. And, 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 uh, given that, then, then when they finally start laying eggs, they're going to have like a very diverse population drawing on the strengths of each of the drones genetics. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. So Joel, thanks for your email and, and your question. Very good question and timely, too, for this time of year. Uh, coming up on our interview today, we have Dr. Samuel Ramsey. I'm looking forward to this. He's a good guest. Yeah, he's got to be He's got to be getting anxious to get back uh, to Thailand where he was to finish up his uh, work on, on the mite over there. Uh, it'll be good to see what he's planning. Oh, definitely. It really will be, and I'm looking forward to it. All right. Well, let's uh, have a quick word from our friends at Strung Microbials. Hello, beekeepers. Your honeybees face a lot of challenges out there. Unbalanced food sources from monoculture crops, holding yards, drought, food shortages, antibiotics, pesticides, and pathogens like chalk brood. To overcome these challenges, your bees need the multiple bacteria that are in all nectars, pollens, and the environment. These bacteria aid honeybees' digestion and improve your honeybee's response and resilience to pesticides. Now you can help improve your honey colony health with a quick, easy, and safe to use product. Strong Microbials Super DFM Honeybee uses naturally occurring bacteria to restore the healthy gut biome of your honeybees. 
Check them out today at www.strongmicrobials.com. Welcome back. And sitting right across the virtual desk from me right now is <laughs> Dr. Samuel Ramsey. Sammy, welcome back to Beekeeping Today podcast. <laughs> I'm always glad to be here. Oh, thank you. Thank you. How many times has it been? I, you know, uh, not enough. Probably, uh, this is probably the third or fourth. Third, I thought so. I think, third, it, I think it's yeah. the third time. You know, yeah, that's about right. it's one of the biggest compliments you can get when somebody invites you back twice. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And the third time, it's like, woohoo. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Jeff, I liked your answer better. Not enough. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that was good. <laughs> it's good to see you again, Sammy. And I hope we can catch Great up on here. what you've been doing and what you're gonna be doing. Sounds like you're sounds like you have not let grass grow under your feet. <laughs> uh, when I first came back for the pan, uh, so I was in Thailand when they declared this a pandemic, and then had yeah. to return in a hurry. And I really did think that grass was going to grow under my feet, but uh, yeah, uh, Rolling Stone gathers no moss, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Well, you've been here before and you were talking about fat bodies and then you were talking about yes. triple A laps and mm -hmm. I'd like to catch up. We'd like to catch up on, on what's happened since we talked to you about Varroa and fat bodies and bees. Okay. So things have been really, let's say, eventful in the lab since then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've been very interested in how we can translate this whole Varroa feeding on fat body thing from being the... Uh, the, the intrigue that it can be uh, to something that can actually be a functional method of us managing Varroa Destructor. It turns out that the mites need a few different proteins from the fat body of the bees in order to actually produce the eggs that they create. And these are the same eggs, of course, that are driving their population numbers. And so if we can manage their ability to extract these proteins from the honeybee's fat body, then we can manage the populations of the mites by managing their reproductive processes. So I've been working through this back and forth, trying to figure out how we can um, figure out what these proteins are. And it's been an exciting process of actually looking at, um, well, it's been an exciting process actually looking at the biochemical processes available here. So, um, yeah, I've been in the lab working with individuals who know a lot more than I do about biochemistry, learning from them and seeing how we can apply all of it. Would that be something along the lines of a, a some sort of chemical or drug to alter the, the protein that affects the, the varroa or removing the protein? How would that so, work? The mites have carriers. They're carriers in their saliva and their biochemical carriers in their body that are actually moving these proteins from the fat body of the bees that's being broken down. Mm. Uh, it's protecting these proteins because they need them intact and then moving them to a special organ inside of the varroa mite's body called the lyrate organ. And the lyrate organ is really important because it's this strange uh, sort of, it's this weird oddly shaped organ that develops a weird tube with the egg and it pumps nutrients into the egg and inflates it to a gigantic size. These eggs end up being far larger than you would expect for an organism. Like it seems like there's somewhere between 30 and 40% of the mite's body volume and they make an egg this large every 30 hours. So in order wow. to do that, obviously they're extracting a large volume of nutrition, but they're also keeping it from being broken down, which is remarkable. When we eat things, our digestive enzymes and our stomach break everything down into its tiny little constituent parts, and then sometimes we reassemble them into other things that we may need. The mites aren't wasting their energy going through that process of breaking things down and reassembling it. They're just taking stuff and throwing it into their eggs, and it's crazy to watch. But we've been able to image this in the lab. Uh, we've been able to use uh, fluorescence microscopy in addition to uh, micro CT to actually image the development of the egg, the connection of the tube there, and show these eggs swelling up over time. And we've actually been able to trace the proteins that are moving through this process as well. So I'm really, really excited uh, to start actually reaching the point where we try to disrupt the carriers that are moving these proteins because the carriers are the big deal. If we can yeah. stop the carrier from carrying the protein, then we have mites that are trying to feed but can't get the nutrition to where it needs to be. 
Oh, wow, that's very cool. <laughs> I, I can only wish my chickens were that productive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would be frightening yeah. <laughs> to see an egg that large every day from a chicken. <laughs> but uh, but I tell you, it's it, it's it's I I always lose people here. Because everyone that I talk to, uh, I'm talking to beekeepers, and we all love our bees. But there is a, a, a section of biology where scientists get to, and we kind of just have to pause and admire the parasites. Because they have worked really, really, really hard to reach this level of proficiency where they can do this crazy stuff. And Varroa is one of those parasites. They have reached a remarkable level of proficiency. And I have to sit there and say, you know what? You've, 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 you've impressed me with how resourceful you can be. I still want you dead, but you have impressed me. <laughs> well, it does sound like it's there. They are quite productive. And, and from where I sit, I don't, I, I, what's the word I want? I admire the discovery of this. <laughs> I'm just now hoping somebody can come up. Oh, you know, if we just feed bees this, that'll fix it. <laughs> Um, but I, I'm sure oh, it's not going to be that simple, but I, I admire the discovery of this. I'm impressed. Yeah. Uh, now, so I am a biologist through and through, like entomology has been my thing. I, I absolutely love looking at how the biological systems work. But when you get to the next step in this process, when you get to the part where you're trying to disrupt how proteins work on a molecular level and disrupt how carriers, molecular carriers work... This is where things branch into a section of biochemistry where you're outside of my wheelhouse and I'm asking more questions than I can answer. And so I'm really delighted to get to work with the incredible team that we have at the, the USDA Bee Research Lab because we've got people with all kinds of, of skills in different areas and we have a, a couple of individuals with biochemistry degrees that can really help with this. But what they've told me is this is the part that takes a while. Because you're not only screening a chemical for its impact on a carrier inside of the mite, you're also screening this chemical to make sure that there are no cross reactions with the host. You don't want it to be, there are all kinds of chemicals we could easily put into this system that would disrupt the carrier, that would kill the varroa, but they would also have impacts on the honeybees. And we're looking for that diamond in the rough, that scenario where we find the one that impacts the carrier and stops the mites from being able to transfer their nutrition to their eggs, but doesn't actually hurt the bees. Or the honey. Yeah, well, yes, <laughs> or the honey. So it doesn't sound like it's going to be as easy as crushing herbal tea leaves and sprinkling them across <sighs> the uh, hive, does it? I wish, <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> science is something that will constantly push you to be patient. Um, so yeah. I'm, I'm learning that as excited as I get in these moments of, oh, wow, look at these things that we're, we're finding. It can take a while for them to actually be translated into the functional system where they're being used inside of a colony. Yeah. Well, it'd be that's it, exciting. The the process and the the direction that you're going sound like it beats the heck out of putting poison in a hive. Yeah. Yeah. That's the goal. Yeah. The goal is to get us off the pesticide treadmill. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I talk to people all the time. I've been speaking to a lot of groups. One of the things I've been doing with a lot of my time in uh, isolation has been speaking to uh, different beekeeping groups and trade groups from all kinds of areas. And when I'm talking to <laughs> beekeeping groups, <laughs> I've been in more than a few scenarios where they've told me, oh, uh, you're, we're going to get a pretty good turnout today. Uh, we're going to get maybe 120 members. We used to have a much bigger group than this, though. And then we had a split. We had a Varroa <laughs> treatment people split and a, a, a non-treatment split. And we just can't seem to, to go eye to eye on that. Like we did th those two groups, they just keep butting heads and we had to separate into two totally different groups. I don't think that's necessary because at the end of the day, we've both got the same goal. Like all of us, whether you're in the non-treatment category or the treatment category, we want to see a day where we never have to put chemicals into a colony again. We just have different ideas about how to reach that goal. And if we can start collaborating and talking through what that means, then we can much more easily reach uh, a point where we're understanding each other there. Well, I wonder, Sammy, does this biochemistry translate to tropolylapse? 
Uh, ho, ho. All right. <laughs> now we're digging into things. So these tropey mites. Uh, and so uh, Kim's asking about Tropolelaps mercedesi, which is one of four species from the genus Tropolelaps. Uh, it is a mouthful to attempt to say that. <laughs> yeah. And it is even more of a mouthful when you try to say this in other countries where they don't even have some of these letters in their language or in like there, it's just. It doesn't work for them. So when I was in Thailand, I learned that uh, getting people to say tropolelaps usually doesn't work, but tropimites works really well. And I found that that translates well in the U.S. as well. Um, people trying to say tropolelaps mercedesi oftentimes will fail at that, but tropimite works. So these tropimites, they are just running around, destroying honeybee colonies and expanding their geographic range every year. And that makes somebody like me nervous because I've spent a lot of time looking at what Varroa did a good 30 years ago when it was on its way, when it was moving through the different uh, areas of the world until it could reach the, the U.S. Uh, more than three decades ago. And uh, Tropolelaps is doing something very similar. The tropy mites are going from country to country to country now, and they're now found in Oceania, they're found in the Middle East, and mm -hmm. as they move through the Middle East, uh, they can easily reach the West and more broadly become distributed around the world. So what are we going to do about these tropy mites? I would love it if the work that we are doing now to try to disrupt the uh, the biochemical processes of Varroa destructor actually works on the tropy mite. But we don't know that yet because one of the things that we still don't know about the tropy mite is what do they eat? Now, I have some hypotheses in this process, but I don't want to bias the system. Um, they are also organisms that generate gigantic eggs uh, and it leads me to believe that they must be siphoning off a, a, a really nutritively dense tissue in order to meet that biochemical demand. So it's very possible that these mites are feeding on the same tissue that Varroa is. And it's very possible that they're using a related system of carriers to get those molecules <laughs> to where they need to be eventually. But we don't know the answers to that yet. Uh, the, the work that I've conducted so far in Thailand has spanned a little more than six months, and it was a 12-month project. And so I've got a lot more to do, and I'm very excited to get back to it uh, after this brief musical interlude called COVID-19. <laughs> Better Be is pleased to sponsor today's episode of Beekeeping Today podcast. For over 40 years, Better Bee has supplied beekeepers across the country with the tools, equipment, and knowledge needed to succeed. Because many Better Bee employees are beekeepers themselves, they understand your needs and challenges and are better prepared to answer your beekeeping questions. From their colorful catalog to their support of beekeeper educational activities, including this podcast, Better Bee truly lives up to their tagline of beekeepers serving beekeepers. See for yourself at betterbee.com. How are you how are you going to make getting back there happen? <laughs> well, uh, we've got one step of that out of the way, or technically two, if you think about it. I am actually coming back from getting my second shot, um, the, the, the Pfizer vaccine, actually. And so that's one thing out of the way. I need to get vaccinated. Um, the process of getting a visa now is going to take substantially longer because of the backlog that is accumulated during the pandemic. But I'm working on that months in advance of when I'll need it. I'm expecting that I'll be leaving for Thailand in the fall. And so I'm working through the elements of that process now. I've already drafted a budget. Um, I'm working on the fundraising process, which is going to be exciting uh, again, I'm sure, uh, <laughs> and looking at different grants that might be available. There's multiple granting agencies that are not providing grants now because of the revenue they lost during the pandemic. Mm. The last time you were here, you were talking about um, getting outside help funding and not grants, but yeah. uh, like a well, tell me how what you were thinking. The last time that I was here, one of the things that I was considering was actually starting a foundation. Because if you have a, a nonprofit, the collection of funds uh, through fundraising processes is a lot easier to work with. It can be a bit unwieldy at first, um, working with the, uh, the, the, the lengthy process that can be and the lengthy forms that it takes. But when you get everything in place, it, it 
can be a really great thing. So uh, I started working on developing the Ramsey Research Foundation last year, a little while after talking to you guys the last time we talked. And I'm happy to say that it's up and running now. Um, the donate page is live. And so if any of your viewers or, or your listeners are interested, they can actually donate directly to not just the Tropy project, but I'm also working on a project on Asian giant hornets. And I'll have the opportunity to collect uh, multiple hornet species while I'm in Thailand and look at their genetics for this project as well. Very nice. And we will have uh, links to your foundation in the show notes. Sweet. <laughs> I really yeah. appreciate you guys. <laughs> so, so. When you get back there, when you get back to Thailand and you're looking at, you're mm -hmm. looking at, now you're going to be looking at trophy mites and giant Asian hornets at the same time? Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to get to sleep I'll, at all? Yeah. <laughs> so the primary focus is going to be the trophy mites, but the USDA, in, in partnership with the W, uh, the, the, the Washington State Department of Agriculture, so the WSDA, uh, we have been trying to get really solid samples of Asian giant hornets that we can look at for uh, we can look at the genetics of these organisms. And one of the things that we would like to determine is where did the hornets that ended up in the Pacific Northwest come from? Because if we can figure out where in the broad geographic range of that organism, where did ours come from? We can better understand how we can mitigate those sorts of scenarios from happening in the future. But right now, we have no I no real solid idea um, of where exactly uh, they came from. And so actually collecting some Asian giant hornet specimens from different areas of Asia and looking at their genetics and comparing them to the ones that we have in the U.S., that will be great stuff. But I'm going to be doing the collection part. Um, the genetics, I'll be leaving up to some experts in genetics. Uh, I am not one. I'm thinking collecting. I wouldn't want to be an expert in that either. <laughs> I, I, was, I was just going to say, I would, I'd rather stay in the lab and work on the genetics and let, let someone else do the collection on, on the Asian giant hornets. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's funny that you say that because it's, it's, it's the other way around with me. Uh, the genetics part is really exciting. But the part that really gets my blood pumping is thinking about getting the chance to see these colonies again. When I was in Thailand, I was constantly dealing with hornets of multiple different species. They were mm -hmm. showing up in my colonies and cleaning them out. And it's rough when you purchase. Uh, I ended up buying 96 colonies when all was said and done. And these hornets have just ripped through them. They can do so wow. much in such a small amount of time because their populations within uh, an entire nest, they need a lot of protein. And so they want to go into a colony and clean out all the brood. And in order to do that, they also have to kill all of the adult bees. So you just end up with just a mess when you open up that colony later. Well, I think it's kind of crazy, but when I was there, I was focused, so focused on the trophy mites that I didn't spend much of any time uh, taking pictures of the giant hornets, looking at their behavior. All I was doing was, well, I, I probably shouldn't, uh, I don't want to encourage such a thing, but uh, <laughs> knowing about the behavior of the scouts and how easily distracted they are at the front entrance of the colony, I was uh, hitting them with um, the lid of the, the colony and knocking them on the ground and stepping on them. Not recommended at home. <laughs> But <laughs> uh, I actually wish that I had collected some of those to take back. It would have been really helpful for our genetic work. So you've watched you've watched wow. these hornets decimate colonies. Your 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 colonies yep. over there, and and we've talked to the people from Washington that have done some of this, and and some have been over there looking at. But <clears throat> with this much firsthand experience, how long does it take for a colony to get mm -hmm. destroyed by these hornets? I mean, are you talking so, days or hours or minutes? Unfortunately, it's a matter of hours for the actual process of killing all of the adult bees. What happens first is you get a scout. The scout flies over and it finds a colony and it's going to try to identify whether that colony is worth their time. Uh, is there a lot of brood present in this colony? Are there a lot of bees here? If they are able to identify that, they'll, well, first they'll mark the colony. They'll mark it with some pheromones so that they know how to get back to it next time. Then they'll fly back to their nest 
recruit their sisters, and a squadron of giant hornets, a few dozen of them, will show up at the colony and destroy everything. They go into what we call the slaughter phase, where they exhibit no other behavior but to turn around and chop the heads off of any moving bee. So after they've decapitated every moving bee in the colony, then they go through and they scrape all of the brood out of the wax and they kind of form it into a squishy meatball and then start flying those back to the colony. This stage, what we call the occupation phase, that how long that takes depends on how large the colony is. If it happens to be a really big colony, maybe three or four boxes, that can take a couple of days. And so they will occupy that colony. They'll even sleep inside of that colony and they'll use it as an extension of their own nest and they will defend it with their lives. If, if a beekeeper shows up and tries to open that, that colony thinking that their bees are still inside, the hornets will go off. And it can be that that is the time where the beekeeper is most likely to be hurt by these organisms. Wow. But after they've cleaned the place out, they have no further interest in it. They leave that colony. They fly back home and they use all of that extra protein to make a bunch of really huge queens. You want to come out and open my hives, Kim? <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm a little nervous opening them up. Oh, I guess. Well, uh, that, that's that's that, that's the most dynamic uh, uh, description I've I've ever heard of these things. And since you've been there, and and mm-hmm. you know how bad they are, yeah. What kind of protective gear were you wearing? <laughs> hmm. um, so. I don't want to alarm you too much. But <laughs> oh, that's, you're when, way past that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in China, I've seen these really cool suits. They look like space suits. They're made of really thick foam, and they are thick enough such that the hornets can't sting through it. And I thought, when I was talking to other people in Thailand, the primary reason why they weren't using those suits was because they are expensive. And that is a big reason for it. But they told me that even if I bought them one, they said, you know, it's it's just too hot here. It's too hot here in Thailand for us to put on something like that. We're just not going to do it. So the hornet hunters that I know of, that I've seen actually take down these colonies, they choose to just wear a veil. And they're not too concerned about the stings to the rest of their body. And the goal is to just keep the number of stings below 36, because there's sort of a threshold. If you get more than a few dozen stings, then the actual impact that the venom has on your body transitions quite substantially. And you start seeing uh, necrotizing effects where each sting can leave this whole section of of flesh that doesn't heal anymore and just turns into a kind of viscous blob. And that's kind of gross. Maybe I shouldn't have said that over the... (laughs) No one wants to hear that. (laughs) But if you keep things under um, a few dozen stings, it hurts. Hurts like heck. But And I haven't been stung yet, so I don't know this from experience, but I've seen people who have been stung by them. I've seen people be stung by them. Uh, it, It hurts quite a bit, but you will survive the experience. I wonder how they rate on Justin Schmidt's sting sting uh, scale. Yeah, the sting index. That's a yeah. great question. I wonder as well. Well, report back to us, would you? When you, <laughs> <laughs> I do not plan to be stung by these organisms. So one of the, I will only do a hornet hunt at night. There are some people who are bold enough to try this kind of thing during the day, but I will only do a hornet hunt at night. Um, And the way that they do them in Thailand is absolutely fascinating. You So you go and do this hornet hunt in the the dead of night, and they take with them uh, some fuel and a a rag to that they'll uh, they'll soak that rag in fuel. And then (laughs) they'll put it on a long stick light it on fire and hold it on that very long stick under the the nest itself. And these are the above ground nests where this works best. Because the nests are made out of paper, it's just chewed up plant pulp, it burns really quickly. There's this flash as the 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 the, the colony kind of goes up in flames, but it just mostly burns off the paper shell and a little bit of the inside of the colony is charred. And it that big flash kills a bunch of the adults but there's still several of them that are still alive. And I've seen people dispatch the rest of them with an electrified tennis racket. And if you want to see someone look like a total boss, you want to see a gentleman <laughs> with an electrified tennis racket just swiping hornets out of the air. It is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> now, you don't want to damage the brood. That's the most important part because the brood 
is something that you can sell for a ridiculous amount of money in Asia. People like to eat the brood, and the brood also makes this gooey amino acid mixture that's been shown in a few studies to actually have some benefit to athletes. Uh, supposedly, it uh, can allow for better, better functioning, more efficient mm. functioning of their muscles. So people will take this and use it as a pharmacological substance, and they can sell it to different agencies. So no one wants to hurt the brood. People will protect that brood with their lives. Isn't that part of the uh, the thought is the the Asian giant hornets that are in North America might have come across as brood for that reason? <sighs> Lord, Lord, Lord. I, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I'm just, you know, there's a lot of speculation. <laughs> Jeff, before this present, or before all of this started, you told me that there would be no gotcha questions, sir. Look oh. at these questions <laughs> you're asking me. I tell you. Um, so it it is true that that it is... It has been the case before that people have intentionally brought hornet colonies into the U.S. Uh, from different countries, and we think it was with the intent to start a business marketing this amino acid mixture in the U.S. And we are very much hoping that that's not how the hornets that have currently arrived got here, but uh, we cannot say for sure. Well, I do, I do ride with a lot of cyclists from the Pacific Northwest, and no one's mentioning you know, bee juice. So yeah. <laughs> just officially on the well, record. You, if you could keep your ear to the ground on that one and let all, <laughs> let, let me know specifically if you hear anyone mentioning that they're on uh, Hornet juice. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> I'm juicing. <laughs> I can see the bee supply catalogs next, next year with electric tennis rackets and beetle oh, juice. My uh, <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> You know, something else that's come out of this, you know, people looking at this this hornet over there was, um, I, I think it was folks from Canada discovered that that some of the honeybees spread some kind of fecal material on the landing board to scare, oh, to scare away yes. hornets. How does that work? And does that work? So this part. This part is, and it does work. It works very well. This is really, really exciting research. Um, so... In Vietnam, they noticed this really odd behavior of Apis serrana bees, so the most closely related species to the Apis mellifera bees that we have in the West. Uh, these Apis serrana bees were flying over to very large deposits of water buffalo dung and just collecting it. And at, at first, um, it can kind of seem like maybe they're just collecting some fluid from it. Maybe they're thirsty. We've noticed bees, even when we give them pristine water, for some reason they want the gunkiest, saddest, weirdest looking water possible. All of us have noticed this once in a while. So uh, that's probably what I would have thought was going on there at first. But if you watch them more closely, they're taking solid matter back to the nest and then smearing it on the front of the interest, uh, of, of the entrance of the colony. And they're doing it in earnest. A bunch of bees going back and forth doing this over and over and over in a very small amount of time. The reason is because they've detected that a hornet has arrived at the nest and has wiped the end of its abdomen across the front of their colony. And that is the kiss of death for the honeybees because there is not a lot that bees can do when an entire squadron of hornets alights on them. Apis serrana have a, a couple of behaviors that can be very effective, but unfortunately they can really tax the colony itself. And if you don't work with that, that first shot, if you happen to allow for that scout to get in the colony and recognize how large it is and then leave, the next thing that you can do in that process is keep them from coming back. And so the very pungent fecal matter that they smear on the front of the colony, that's really important because it can mask the smell, the pheromone that the hornets are going to use to navigate back to that nest. And if the hornets can't smell where the nest is, they'll get really confused and eventually give up and head back home. Hmm. Whoa. <laughs> what a, yeah. It's one of the only examples that we have of insects using uh, tools. That's, that's and exactly it's kind what of I was going to say. Is, uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> there's a third product you'll see in, in um, bee supply catalogs next yeah. season. It will be, will be because if you live in town and you don't own a dog, finding some of that may be a problem. It's a good point. You need some water buffalo dung. <laughs> <laughs> Just that water. 
I, 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 <laughs> um, I mentioned this to a group of beekeepers just last week and they asked me, or two weeks ago actually, and they asked me if, uh, if it would work to spray this preemptively on the front of their colonies. And I saw the wheels turning like behind their eyes. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not how it works. It has to go, uh, you have to spray it over top of the hornet's uh, pheromone that they've spread on the colony. So it doesn't help for you to just spray all of your colonies down with dung and hope that that means that hornets won't arrive there. If they can then arrive at that colony and spread their pheromone on top of that smell, then they can still find that colony. Wow. Wow, that's really amazing. So what else, we're coming up close to the end of our time here. What else have you been looking at and would like to share with us today? Oh my goodness. Okay. Well then, a couple of things that I'd like to address. One, sure. we've got a new system now for that can be used to actually determine which species of trophy mite you're looking at. Um, these these mites, a lot like Varroa destructor, can be really difficult for you to distinguish bet uh, between. So for a while, we thought that Varroa destructor and Varroa jacobsoni were the same species. And there are all kinds of papers written about Varroa jacobsoni in the U.S. Uh, killing colonies. And it turned out all that time we were looking at a totally different species, but we couldn't tell because they look so similar. And unfortunately, we found that that is a trend in honeybee mites because the four species of trophy mites look very similar to each other. And it's really hard to distinguish between them unless you get really good samples and a very, very, very well-trained researcher specialized in that group. Well, what a set of researchers has determined is that by using a system called high-resolution melting, where you take a sample of the mite's DNA and then you melt it, <laughs> you can look at the melting point <laughs> of this DNA, which is so cool. Um, you can look at the point where the double-stranded DNA separates into two strands, where it, it, it pretty much melts into its two constituent parts. Um, based on the connections between all of those um, nucleotides, you can determine based on when it finally splits what species you're looking at because each species will have a unique profile. I know that that's mind-blowing and that's awesome. That's crazy. That is crazy. <laughs> so they've used this as a system. Um, they've found out that it has enough resolution to actually distinguish between each species of trophy mite. And that's really great because now we can determine which species people are seeing without having to invest in a, a very specialized individual looking at a very specialized organism and trying to figure out if he can see a difference between them. Well, that's the next question. Is, has have people noticed a difference between the species? Are they... I mean, the last time you were here, you spelled out their life cycle pretty good, and, and the controls that they were using were mostly go queenless, uh, so you don't have mm -hmm. brood. Uh, are, do all four mm -hmm. react about the same way if you got them go queenless? So most of the research that we have on trophy mites is related to tropolelaps mercedesi, and that's unfortunate because that leaves a really substantial knowledge gap for the other three species. There's simply not much that we know about Tropolelaps coenigerum, Tropolelaps tai, or Tropolelaps clarii. So what we're looking at here is the potential to do a parasitological survey of Southeast Asia. And that way, when we can catalog all of the different parasites, the way that all of these parasites look such that they'll be easier to identify and their genetic material, it'll allow us to not be caught off guard if one of them should end up in the West. We'll know what the organism looks like. We'll know its life cycle. We'll know uh, what damage it can potentially cause and we'll know what can control it. And so uh, that information to my mind is desperately needed because every time something shows up, we're like, what do we do about this one? I don't know. Well, it's going to take us a while to figure it out. And in that period of time, that organism can become established and wreak havoc. And so that's what I'm up to, but it's going to take a bit. And right now I haven't been able to work with uh, the other three species of trophy mites yet. So unfortunately, I can't answer your question about that, Kim. We'll catch you next time. <laughs> That's the goal. Good, good. Well, you'll first have to figure out which 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 one of those three you have actually at your research station in Thailand. Exactly. And that's what's so great about this HRM system, the high resolution melting system, is that you can um, just do a PCR test to amplify the region that you're looking at and then put it through this, this system for high resolution melting and you can determine which of the species you've got. Amazing. So how many, how many mites does it take to do that? 
<laughs> well, in the, the study that they were working with, uh, they were able to show that you can do this. Like if you're comparing two different mites, you can run these two against each other with just one of each, which is wow. really, really cool. That is really cool because those are so small. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're really tiny, but you've got plenty of DNA in there. Oh, my gosh. Hey, running out of time. I saw, I've seen some things on social media. I want to run by you real quick, if you don't Sweet. mind. This is the lightning round, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's this do this the, thing. This is the big money round. <laughs> okay, so uh, I did see that you have out there with Scholastic Teachers Earth Day. Do you want to talk yeah. about it? This is non b specific, but it's uh, but it's uh, projects that you're involved in. So I'd be give you a chance here to talk about the Earth Day and Scholastic Teachers. Well, thanks for that plug. Um, I've been trying to figure out how best I can advance um science education, STEM in general, and just generally science literacy. Because in a lot of areas of the country we have seen as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, that a lot of people just weren't willing, weren't comfortable trusting the science that was coming out about uh, COVID-19, about how it spread, about ways that we can protect ourselves and each other and all of this. And so it's important to me to see that people understand science because it's one thing to say, you should listen to us because we're researchers. Trust me, I'm a doctor. It's another thing to say, well, this is how scientists scientific research works, because when individuals can actually see inside of the black box, when they know how the system works, they're much more inclined to trust it. So I'm really excited to be a part of different, um, different initiatives that are working to increase science literacy. And I love this one with Scholastic for Earth Day because it targets individuals who are younger. If we can help people understand science when they're growing up, you can pull them in. And some of those students are going to become scientists, but all of those yeah. students are going to understand science better than they would have uh, if not otherwise. And so I'll be uh, talking about the the research that I've can, conducted. I'll be talking about science in general and uh, about the environment. And I'm looking forward to doing this with Scholastic. Just last thing here, because I know our time is short. I saw something you responded to, and it showed a video of the golden tortoise beetle. Yeah. Now this look, I'd never seen this before and is absolutely phenomenal insect. What, Every, what is that? I mean, yeah. In anybody who is listening to this podcast right now, if you are not driving, now is a wonderful time <laughs> for you to pause it and Google golden tortoise beetle. It is a beautiful insect. It is in the family Chrysomelidae. These are called the leaf beetles. They're beetles that, of course, are very closely associated with leaves. But this particular group of Chrysomelids has this really odd um, element of their exoskeleton where their shell is transparent um, for this really, it, it, it's sort of arrayed on the edges as transparent. And then there's this gold extending from yeah. the middle off to the sides where it looks like a turtle shell in the middle with the legs of the turtle sticking out, these four legs sticking out. It's beautiful. And then the it way is. that they walk, they kind of just bumble <laughs> around and they look like little turtles with gold embedded in their shells. It's breathtaking. And then the video I saw, they, they, they would fly off and they looked like the little sparkles in a Disney movie. Mm hmm. It was just it, phenomenal. It was just phenomenal. I mean, I know that this is this is bug geeky, but I'm sure <laughs> many bee, beekeepers can can appreciate the the fascination with all things crawly. I I love that beekeepers have the opportunity to interact so consistently with insects that they can understand me when I geek out about bugs because I've been fascinated with insects since I was seven. And so I've come across so many fascinating groups of insects. The honeybees are not the only ones. There are so many cool insects in this world that do incredible things and have inspired all kinds of uh, works of, of fiction and nonfiction and it's great stuff. <laughs> We're going to have some cicadas yeah, here this cool. summer. Sammy, would oh, you like <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I am, for any of you who have just moved to the area, any of you who have moved to a region of the country where brood 10 will be emerging, I'm so excited for you because <laughs> this is going to be an experience for you. First of all, you're going to hear some noises that you've never heard before in your life. Second of all, you're going to see some creatures that look different from anything that you've ever seen. But the cicadas are these weird, generally large insects for, for a bug. Um, they are true bugs. Their mouth parts are a straw. And they have spent about 
They've spent more time in isolation than you have, so they can really identify with you in that. They've spent time <laughs> underground, 17 years in isolation, not seeing another cicada uh, in all of that time. And so the moment they emerge from underground, all they can think of is, I want to I wanna party. I want to see every other cicada that I can see. Uh, I want to lay eggs. I want to, like, and, and they get all of this living into just a few weeks of their lives. Uh, after 17 years underground, now that they've emerged as adults, they spend all this time enjoying each they other. They do. And I think that we can identify with that because <laughs> there are a lot of people who are are about to leave isolation and all they want to do is see their friends and their family and party it up. Uh, the, the only piece of advice, I, this is the second one that I've seen. I was here 17 years oh. ago. And uh, the only thing that that uh, that got in the way was was don't let your cat eat one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh guys you're gonna have to keep an eye on your pets pets can choke yeah. on these things their eyes are bigger than their stomachs and cicadas they are just not the brightest bugs in the world they're kind of uh for lack of a better word they're derpy um, they do not have a method of defending themselves from predators aside from the fact that there are just so many of them. So they walk around and bump into things and dogs and cats and raccoons and birds, everything is going to see them as an easy meal. Unfortunately, cats don't always chew their food particularly yes. well. So keep an eye on your dogs and cats. All right. Well, Dr. Samuel Ramsey, Sammy, we definitely appreciate having you here <laughs> with us again. Uh, you're welcome back anytime. We look forward to talking to you again. And and fans of Dr. Ramsey, you can find him out on uh, Twitter. And are you on Instagram too? Yeah, you're yes. on Insta Instagram. Mm -hmm. And we'll have the link to the foundation in our show notes. Sweet. And we can find you on Shortwave mm -hmm. uh, on the NPR uh, podcast. And, uh, well... We look forward to having you back. Yes. Thanks for joining us today. <laughs> Definitely. I'm always delighted to be with you guys. Hey, Kim, it's really good, as always, to have Sammy on our show. I know I've said that about six times in the last uh, hour here of the episode, but uh, it, it, he is uh, energetic and just a, a great, great spokesperson for beekeeping industry and, and research in the, in the area. Gotta get worn out just listening to him, <laughs> all the stuff that he's up to. And, it, you know going this direction with, with uh, the trophy mite and this direction with the hornet and raising funds for his trip. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know how he does it. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's full speed uh, for Sammy, but that's good. Um, he's, he's accomplished a lot and it's fun. It's really, really, really fun. Yeah. I, I'm, 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 I'm excited to hear about the, his work with Varroa. That, that, to me, all this other stuff is exciting, but the, the work with Varroa, I mean, I can see the day when we don't have to put poison in a hive. I, w I would like that, too. The, the, the poisons and the chemicals in the hives, I mean, we have to do it or we choose to do it, those beekeepers who want to. But it'd be nice to have the option not to use any kind of chemicals or poison in a hive or against on the bees. So I'm all for yep. that. Yep, and and any of the the research he's doing uh, in beforehand on the trophy mites, uh, hopefully, we'll never need to use that here in the United States. But hope uh, the work he's doing will help benefit those uh, beekeepers in the Southeast Asia as well. That'd be good. Can you imagine being stung thirty six times by one of those things, and then saying, "Hey guys, <laughs> I got to stop. I just did thirty six. <laughs> no, oh, uh, man, I, just a just a veil. That's that's amazing. No, no, that, no, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I've I've been I've been bitten by uh, spiders when starting having the skin, you know, just the pocket of skin just start dying and that yucky middle part that happens when it starts Ooh. dying. And that's not fun and I can't imagine having 36 of those welts well, melting on your body. Wish wish him luck. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. he doesn't have to go through that. Well, I look forward to hearing from him on the, uh, as he travels. Yep. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars in Apple Podcasts wherever you download and stream the show. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for a new podcast know what you like. 
You can get there directly on our website by clicking reviews along the top of any web page. As always, we thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for their continued support of Beekeeping Today podcast. We want to thank our regular episode sponsor, Global Patties. Check them out at www.globalpatties.com. We also want to thank Beer and Slava at Strong Microbials for their support of their podcast. Check out their probiotic line at www.strongmicrobials.com. And we want to thank Better Bee for joining us as our latest supporter. Check out all their great beekeeping supplies at www.betterbee.com. And finally, and most importantly, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to send us questions and comments at questions at beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. Anything else, Kim? I think that about wraps it up. I need to rest. (laughs) Yeah, I hear you. Take care.